So the, the topic today we're going to talk about is quantitative approaches to demand forecasting. And this is really just to get us started. And then we'll spend more time actually implementing specific quantitative approaches using R and RStudio. So the agenda for this video is to just talk about what are the characteristics of forecasts? What are the steps of statistically forecasting time series data? What are the time series components? And then what are measures of forecast error and bias? If you're following along in the textbook, this is chapter seven. So as a reminder from last time, we talked about the importance of demand forecasting. Specifically, supply chain management relies heavily on demand forecasts um, because we need to know some estimate for what kind of level of typically sales um, to expect because we need that estimate to make decisions about all kinds of things from staffing to inventory to locations um, and demand forecasting serves as that basis for those um, decisions. And in fact, um, everything else we'll talk about this class, we will use a forecast as an input to our um, follow on models and uh, decision making. So, you know, given that we need to do this, that companies have to um, forecast demand, what, what is all involved? So first we need to identify factors that would influence future demands. So we're predicting something in the future. We don't know what's gonna happen, but we can hopefully estimate it better if we understand relationships between these factors and future demand. So typically uh, forecasts, um, specifically demand forecasts have two components. One is historical data. Examples of historical data would be if you have a product that um, has history, it would be sales data, right? So you'd have the past historical data of how this product sold. But if you remember to our, our video about Disney World, you know, it could also be um, data around other things, um, causal effects, um, like the number of schools that are out um, at this time, for example. So there's some quantitative aspects. But most um, demand forecasts also include expert judgments because the background um, from the past won't capture things like, are you planning to advertise or market? So if I'm planning to do that in the future, that likely will change what the historical um, data alone would forecast. Are you planning to discount something? What is the state of the economy? What are some things the competitors will take? These are all actions that aren't represented in the historical data. Um, in, the, in the past, those things didn't happen or they're not represented in our models. And so we need to utilize usually human um, expert judgment to adjust um, them and combine them together to create a demand forecast. So what are the characteristics of forecast? You got to experience those as you did the poster activity. Um, but let's review them again. So the first characteristic is that forecasts are always wrong. If you take away nothing else in this class, but you remember this, forecasts are always wrong, I think that's powerful. Why? Because if we are using these things which get inputted into all these other decisions, we need to be aware of the fact that they are wrong. What does that mean? They're inaccurate. And so we shouldn't expect them to be exactly correct. Instead, we should accommodate and explicitly consider that there will be uncertainty associated with these forecasts and acknowledging, considering, and then ultimately incorporating this uncertainty will make us better at all the other decisions that we're using forecasts as an input. So forecast being wrong is not something we are uh, going to change, but we can first of all work to make them less wrong. We'll talk about that today. But second of all, acknowledging that they're wrong and making sure that you don't treat them like a deterministic uh, piece of information is really, really powerful in whatever future endeavor um, you go on. So first law of forecast, forecasts are always wrong. Second law of forecast, which we saw actually um, illustrated in the Walt Disney World example, is that longer term forecasts are usually less accurate than shorter term forecasts. And so typically, like Disney World did, they usually will have different methodologies for shorter term versus longer term. So if you're trying to predict something the next 15 minutes versus the next five years, that likely uses a different forecasting method, but it also uses different data. Um, and then also you, you will obviously update your forecast as you go along. And so um, typically there are long-term forecasts and more shorter term forecasts. And if you um, wanted to guess uh, which one would be more accurate, shorter term forecasts are typically more accurate. 
The third one is that aggregate forecasts are usually more accurate than disaggregate forecasts. And the reason here is if you have to forecast something very specifically, um, you don't get the power of um, summing uh, variability, summing variances. What I mean by that is if I get to uh, forecast the joint thing of these two, if this one's up and that one's down, they cancel each other out in a way that you don't get to do if this one's up and that one's down, but I don't get the benefit of canceling them out. We will see this um, throughout this class actually, um, but pooling of resources. And one example is forecasting things um, at the pool level is going to be more accurate than at the you know, disaggregate level. And we'll see this actually a lot, um, not just in the forecasting module, but throughout the class. And I think it's a powerful insight to take away as you go through the world and think about minimizing variability. Um, one way to do this is think about aggregate pooled uh, things. And then the final one is that the further up the supply chain, so if you go up, that means you're further and further away from the customer, is you usually don't have as good of information, right? So I'm further away from the true source of the customer's demand, and I have distorted information about what that looks like. That is known as the bullwhip effect. We'll talk about that actually in the second module. So these I think are important things to take away. Um, because yes, we'll, we'll study them more mathematically, we will do things a little bit more computationally, but these are things that really, if you have in your back of your mind and you're taking with you, um, are useful as you make decisions um, and make smart decisions operationally um, throughout your supply chain. So to get started, um, so you know, here it says, oh, you spent a year perfecting a forecast. I'm sure it will be spot on. I hope you can sense the sarcasm in this meme and the sarcasm in me, right? You're not gonna be spot on. It's gonna be wrong. That's the first law of forecast. So, you know, a critic could say, well, given the first law of forecast, why even try? You know, why are we spending time on this? Why does Disney World employ 70 plus people to do this? And this is one of my all time favorite professional quotes is that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, and this is by George Fox, who was a statistician. Um, and so all models are wrong. Our forecast model is going to be wrong, but hopefully it's useful. Um, and I think, you know, this is a part of us as industrial and systems engineers, us as data scientists, um, is to acknowledge that all models are wrong, but hopefully we're useful. And so even the best statistical forecasting model cannot perfectly represent the real world. We are forecasting the future. That is hard. And the first law of forecasting is that they're wrong, right? So, you know, you may say, okay, why well, even try? Well, we're not trying to um, perfect some imaginary perfect system. What we're trying to do is we're trying to create something better than we currently have. We are trying to improve upon the status quo. And so this is important in forecasting, but it's also important in, you know, industrial and systems engineering. This is the importance of capturing the current state. So if you go into a project or a job, um, make sure you're measuring where you're currently at. And then when you're improving, you can quantify the impact. You can be useful. You can be less wrong. Um, and so that is what we're really going to try to do um, in demand forecasting. We're going to you know, have the virtue of being less wrong. That can translate into meaningful um, decision making um, and great supply chain performance improvements. Um, so it is really important. Um, and so, you know, this is something you should take away for forecasting, but broader as well. Uh, try to be less wrong. All right, so how can we be less wrong? Well, we can use different methodologies. And so there are a wide span of different methodologies. Kind of in general, we can think about them in four different categories. Um, they're qualitative, which means we like will get a bunch of people together and ask them things. So if you've ever been part of like a focus group, that's a qualitative way of getting um, information that they can use to predict the future. There is um, many different kind of more um, sophisticated and actually kind of complex methods that rely on qualitative um, approaches. We are not going to study them in this class, but they're very impactful and very useful um, ways. Um, the two that we're going to study um, in this class and primarily the one we're going to study is time series forecasts. Um, and so the idea of a time series, it was going to use historical data um, as a function of time to predict um, the future. And we'll talk about the limitations as well as where this works well um, in this lecture. 
We'll talk a little bit, but not a lot on causal. Um, so that's a relationship between the thing we're trying to predict and some other um, factor. And so you've hopefully seen some of that um, in stat analysis. Um, when you're doing regression, that's exactly what you're doing. You have independent and dependent variables and you're trying to make a relationship between them. This is also um, the area of a lot of you know, data mining, machine learning, et cetera. And so we're primarily gonna focus on time series, but I put this up here a little bit on causal models. And then there are you know, even more complex things like simulation where you're trying to imitate consumer choices that give rise to demand and, and many, many other things. So um, kind of generally citing these in this, um, but we're gonna focus primarily on time series forecasting. So what is a time series? Honestly, um, to be very clear, when I first heard like time series analysis, I was just like, ooh, that seems really cool and probably really hard. This is one of those things where the terminology is probably fancier than what it really is. Okay, so a time series is simply a collection of data and you have on the x-axis time. So on the x-axis, you have time and you have something you're measuring, some collection of data that you present on the x-axis. Um, in this class, we're only gonna deal with things that are evenly spread out. So every day, every minute, every hour. Um, and so the time is you know, evenly spread out. Um, and so we are then are obtaining some y axis, some response variable. In this class, it primarily will be uh, demand. So how much quantity was demanded, but you could think of this um, being used in many, many different um, fields. And so what is the goal um, of time series forecasting? Is it's to isolate patterns in the past data. So we're gonna take historical data and we're gonna say what happened in the past that could be useful to predict the future. It makes um, quite a few limiting um, assumptions. And the biggest one is that the forecast is based only on past values. So there's no other variable important. I can predict the future only with using past historical data. Um, and so what it also is assuming is that the factors influencing the past and the present will continue um, in a similar way in the future. So if I um, identify some pattern in my historical data, I expect that pattern um, to translate into the future. Um, so again, this is not applicable to everything, but it does a really good job of doing a lot of um, forecasts. Um, lots and lots of companies use time series forecasts. Oftentimes they'll augment them with other things, but it actually can be quite powerful. But I want to emphasize that uh, we, the, how are we predicting the future? It's based on what happened in the past and solely what happened in the past. So when you think about an example like COVID happening, most people's forecasts didn't predict that demand was going to hit then because in the past they didn't, right? Um, and so realizing where this is good and where it isn't, I think is also a really good um, skill. So on that, I want to test your knowledge. Um, so if you have three products and you were asked what product is the most appropriate to uh, forecast demand using a time series model, what do you think? Do you think it's A, the new fashion, how much, how many people are gonna buy this dress this season? B, how many people are gonna buy this type of soup uh, in February? Or C, how many people are gonna buy this book um, in February, for example? So even if we um, control for, let's say in the next month, um, which one do you think is the most appropriate use of time series forecast? I hope all of you said B. B is the correct answer um, because the historical data that we had is likely a pretty good predictor of future behaviors. If you think about cold winter days in Troy, people probably eat more soup. Similarly, cold winter days last year, they ate more soup, right? So there's this like pattern of historical things. Also, this is a relatively stable product. We would have a lot of historical data. That would not be the case with A, right? So this is likely a new product. And so if you're asked, uh, can time series forecasting be used for a new product? The answer would be no, because you don't have any historical data. Um, and then C, you know, potentially this could be used, but it would be maybe a little bit more difficult um, because maybe over time as the book um, changes and differences. So, you know, B and C, Potentially, but B would be the most obvious um, use of time series model. All right, so in terms of a time series model, again, we are looking for patterns. And so we're looking for patterns in historical data. 
which then will translate to future data. So what things are we looking for? So we're going to call these things components. Um, you can think about the trend, um, which identifies, does it trend up? Does it trend down? Um, we have level. And one of the things I'm going to emphasize is all as long as you have pieces of data, all of them will have a level because you can take the average. So on your homework that you'll hopefully get started soon, um, when I ask about systematic components, all of them have a level because you can always take the average. Okay, So you can think about taking the average of your historical data. That's the level. Seasonality is something that identifies a pattern, um, but it needs to repeat. Um, and so these are things like if Monday is, diff is a lower day than Friday, that would be something that would repeat. If lunchtime is a different, um, you have more people at lunch than at 3 p.m. every day, you have more people at lunch than 3 p.m., that would be an example of seasonality. Um, that is different than cyclical, which means it's changes as a result of business cycles, usually over the long term. An example of that would be if your company is in a recession or um, something kind of more global that isn't something that's repeating. And then we have um, random fluctuations, which are the fact that we don't know how to deal, deal with them. Um, and so the components of uh, demand is we have something we observe. That's what actually occurs. We have the component that we're able to predict. That's what we're going to call systematic um, components. And then we have the random components. Okay? And so on this uh, graph um, that's getting created here, it's a time series because on the x-axis we have time and you can see that they're at repeatable periods. So this one is an example of every year. You can have different, you know, whatever your you know, measure is on the x-axis, but it's a version of time in you know, equally spaced um, things on the x-axis. Here on the y-axis, we're predicting the demand for a product. So it's, let's say, quantity demanded in year one. The squiggly blue line is what we actually observe. So what are we trying to do? What we're trying to do is predict into the future, what do we think this blue line is going to look like? And we're going to do that by decomposing our historical data into a set of systematic components. Um, and the first one is the trend component. And so is there overall an upward or downward trend? Usually this has to do with, you know, if you're in um, a place where, let's say, like nursing home population, you see that older people are growing, that could, could lead to a trend. If you are a technology that's, you know, getting replaced by a newer technology, maybe you have a downward trend. Um, typically, there are several year duration. Um, seasonal components, here's an example of a seasonal component on a restaurant. And so the seasons are lunchtime and dinner time and then like a lull, right? And so every day you kind of have the same repeating ra um, regular patterns of up or down. So it's important I'm going to emphasize the word regular. Um, oftentimes this is due to, let's say, weather, customs, calendar, right? Like we eat lunch around noon, that's a custom. The calendar, um, if you think about holidays, we buy a lot of things for the, the December holidays. And so if you're a company that sells a lot of things that get bought for Christmas, for example, then you might have a peak in December and November and then a lull in January, right? But that would repeat every year, this pattern, right? So it's really important that it's regular and it's repeatable um, during some sort of single period planning period. Um, and while as the cyclical component, it's, you know, something that's happening kind of outside of um, our control, it's usually affected by some business cycle, again, re um, a recession, um, maybe some economic factors. And in this class, we are not going to um, incorporate them um, in our class or in our uh, models, but realize if you know about these and you can predict them, you are likely going to have a better accurate forecast if you're incorporating um, these cycles. I okay. want to emphasize that these are systematic components. These are the things we're on the hunt for um, to find, right? So these are the patterns we're looking at in the historical data. And these are the things we're going to try to estimate. So in our forecasting models, we are estimating these components and then we're going to combine them together in certain ways. And that's going to be our forecasting model. But as a reminder, all forecasts are wrong. So what we predict is going to deviate from what actually happens. And that deviation is what's called the random component. So again, a random component is not one of the systematic um, components. 
Instead, it's what is left over. I predicted this happened. This actually happened. What's the difference between that? That's the random component. So that's why this line looks like a kindergartner wrote it. If we only had the systematic um, parts, um, it probably wouldn't have these kind of erratic squiggles um, associated with it. So it is due specifically to unforeseen events. These are things we weren't able to capture in our systematic part of our um, model. And they're hopefully short, they're non-repeating. If they're repeating, then you may say, well, maybe I can create a systematic component and model that, right? So this is the randomness that occurs. And this is exactly, you know, all forecasts are wrong. Um, we tried our best, we thought this would happen. This is the deviation. All right, so now we understand those components and those are actually really, really critical. Why? Because if we identify in our historical data that we have certain components, we need to make sure we're using a method that also has those components. Why? Because uh, time series forecasting, remember, uses the past as a predictor of the future. And so if in the past there were these systematic components, we want a model that in the future has those systematic components. So the steps of statistically forecasting time series data is first to plot the historical data and try to understand or identify these trends um, and specifically identify, does your historical data have a seasonal component? And if so, how often does it repeat? Is it a weekly seasonal component? So it repeats every seven days. Is it a monthly um, seasonal component? So it repeats every 12 months or whatever, right? So we first look at the past and identify these um, components. Then we select an appropriate underlying model. And what is appropriate is if you have a history, have a component that ha in the history has this component, you want a model that um, incorporates that because again, our assumption is the past is a good predictor of the future. Then we create a forecasting model. And this word create um, for this is maybe a little bit too bold or like too ambitious or something. What do we do when we create them? Um, for this class, the, the models we're studying, creating them means basically setting these input parameters. And so we will get into this in future lectures, but if you think about some simple model that you're likely all familiar with, like moving average, you would need to determine how many periods do I want to have that moving average over. So that's what the creating of the forecasting model. Um, simple exponential smoothing, you may also have seen this in past classes, you know, that's like, how do we set alpha, for example. So when we say creating a forecasting model, it's setting the input parameters for the models we're going to study in this class. Now we have it, we use the model and the parameters that have been set to forecast future demand. And then demand happens and we say, okay, how did we do? Did we do well? Did we do bad? Is there any way we can improve uh, upon um, our model, and if so, we should update it and then start over. So let's go through this process. So the first pro pro uh, process is to plot the historical data to understand the trends or patterns. Um, you know, here are some examples of them. This is not everything, but you know, you could think about okay, the first one is there is if there's just level, right? There's no real recognizable pattern, but of course, if I have more than uh, one or more dots, I can always take an average and therefore I will always have level as a systematic component. The second one on top, you know, there's a clear trend, you know, it's not perfect. The, the dots are not exactly in that line, but there's tr clearly an upward trend. So the second one would have um, trend and level. Um, there are other things you can you can think about. It doesn't have to be linear. It could be quadratic, et cetera. In this class, we're not going to spend a ton of time on these more complex things. But if you take um, some sort of class uh, on just time series analysis, you'll get into that. Um, and then, you know, the the right bottom right hand corner has, you know, demand um, plus an upward trend that's level and has season seasonality. So we need to first identify those. Um, honestly, the hardest one oftentimes to identify is uh, this guy over here. Is it just stationary? Is there just level or are there other things to do that? And so how do you do that? Um, one way to do that is to understand if there's a correlation between time and the Y axis. So if there's a correlation, that means as I increase time, it's higher likely that I'm gonna have bigger values, right? So if your correlation is closer closer to one, you're likely have a trend. If it's not, then you, you probably don't, right? And I would encourage you all, and I've posted this on LMS, 
to see how good you are at determining um, if there's a trend in, in the data. And so I, I highly recommend you click guess the correlation, you play, play this game and see if you can predict um, the correlation. Um, if you try this, uh, contrary to what most people believe, they're actually quite terrible at this. And if you're interested in the data, um, this person actually studied, studied this, okay? So maybe us personally are bad at it. Don't worry, we have statistics, right? So we can actually um, calculate mathematically what is the correlation. You know, Excel, R, all of them have these really, really quickly. Um, but, you know, don't forget that, that that is something we do. So if you're um, not sure what components, is it really stationary or is there an upward or downward trend, um, calculating a coefficient, uh, correlation coefficient can be helpful in identifying that. Okay, so now you've identified your appropriate um, systematic components. Again, the ones we're going to study in this class are level. All of them will have a level um, because it's just taking the average. Some of them will also have a trend and some of them will have a seasonal factor. Okay? And so once you've identified which components are in there, then we're going to basically combine these systematic components in a, in a way to create um, a forecasting model. And so if you identify that you have only a level, no trend nor seasonality, an appropriate um, time series model would be moving average or simple exponential speed moving. If you identify, nope, there's a level and a trend, but no seasonality, then Holtz method, or also known as exponential smoothing with a trend, would be appropriate. And if you identify that all three of our systematic components are there, Winter's model is appropriate. Um, just want to emphasize, these are the forecasting methods we'll study in this class. There are many, many more beyond this. Um, but the key concept here is you need to make sure your historical data has these components. Because again, our assumption in time series um, forecasting is the past is a good indicator of the future. And so if the past has one of these components and you select a model that doesn't have one of those components, you're not gonna forecast that in the future. Okay. So that's step two, which is selecting which model you wanna use. Once we select these models, they are given usually in, you have some sort of forecast and you have some combination of these different systematic components. You can have uh, something that adds them, some of them that multiply them, some that are a mix. Um, and again, there are you know, more complex models which take you know, to the second power, et cetera, et cetera. We're, we're again, just studying kind of the basic um, ones, but they're basically you can think about, we're trying to create a model that estimates a bunch of these different components and combines them together to get a forecast. So I'm going to emphasize here, you know, is maybe a good place to think about why is then randomness not considered a systematic component? And the answer to that is that randomness is not considered a systematic component because we're not trying to estimate it. We're trying to minimize it, right? We're trying to do as good a job as possible estimating these systematic things, which are like level, trend, and season, and then combining them in the best way that we're really, really accurate and we don't have um, much randomness. Um, and so this is somewhat semantics, um, but that is why um, randomness is not a systematic component. Okay. It's sometimes useful to just get some notation. So this is maybe kind of a weird place to just talk about some notation, but um, here's an example of a forecasting method. So F of T plus one, F of T is the forecast of demand for period T. And you can see that forecast is based on components, um, first of all, an estimate of the level, um, an estimate of the trend, an estimate of the seasonal factor. And this one is um, a mixed model. We're adding some things and multiplying some things. Um, and so the thing I want to emphasize here um, is that we'll use F of T as the forecast, um, but then what actually happens, we'll use D of T. So that's the observed or the actual demand. And then we're gonna calculate errors, which are the difference between what we thought our prediction and what actually happened. We will um, use different ways of combining these and these will be um, different types of forecasting methods, but just to give you um, some information here. The other thing to be aware of now and into the future lectures is that subscripts can be a little bit annoying. So one thing to note is there's sometimes T plus one, sometimes T. Um, those are things you need to be really conscious of. Um, the math seems kind of um, deceptively simple at times the subscripts um, can sometimes be a pain. So please keep um, those detail oriented. 
All right, so how would we actually create a forecasting model? Um, and in this class, we're only going to talk about what's called adaptive forecasting methods. Um, that is in contrast to what's called static forecasting models. And so in this class, we're going to talk about um, adaptive ones, which means if you can see here that our estimates for these systematic components are a function of T. What it means is every time I observe a demand point, I'm going to update what I think my level, what I think my trend, what I think my seasonality is. And so that's different than the static ones. As you can see, they just have a, an L. There's not an L of T. Um, and so in this class, we're going to build a model, observe demand, and then update um, and improve um, that model. So the process of adaptive forecasting is we're going to have to initialize. So we're going to have to start somewhere. So we have to make some assumptions. How do I get started on estimating these level trends, seasonal factors? And then I'm going to you know, estimate, set up my forecast, right? So I'm going to set the parameters of my forecast. And then uh, forecast what I think is going to happen. Demand occurs. And then I'm going to update those forecast um, parameters um, and systematic components. Um, we will see this in action um, as we get started in the next lecture about um, actually implementing these. And we're going to use R. And you know, as you can see, anything with time series, computers are wonderful because you know, we're basically keep updating things. That's something a computer does really well. Humans are bad at. So, you know, computers are really in critical. Specifically, we'll use R, and you'll see this stuff in action. But I want to provide it kind of here for context. All right. So now we um, have okay a model. So now we need to use the model and specifically the parameters that we were set to forecast future demand. And then we're going to um, assess the accuracy of that model and then revise it as 